And we are live. What is going on? Got a little special episode here. Yes, a little supplemental episode. Um, CCX2 Season 3, Episode 10. We're still going to be on for the regularly scheduled episode. That's this Tuesday. But we just we want to slip this in with what's been going on this week. And uh, so here we are. So we'll let some people come in as usual. Um, Today with us, we have Phil Nelson from Legal Heat, founder of Legal Heat, uh, attorney, firearm law expert. Welcome back. Hey, it's good to be here. Good to be back. This is probably round five or six for you, right? Yeah, at least that. Good yeah. every time. Phil, for, for those who don't know, Phil, Phil is one of the favorite guests upon viewers. So he is an extremely knowledgeable person when it comes to firearm law, um, you know, reciprocity, all of that stuff. They, they have an app. You can download the Legal Heat app. On, it's on both, right? Google and Apple? Yep. Yep. As a matter of fact, when I drove from Florida to New York about a month and a half ago, I went to your app, downloaded my custom map to tell me where I could and could not carry to make sure that I was situated. Good. Yeah, we got a lot of stuff coming for that app too. So it's good. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, so we are, you know, we're here obviously because of the, um, the shooting that took place in Texas at the elementary school. We're going to kind of, we got a lot of new information today through the press conference earlier this morning or this afternoon for me. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's turning out to be quite the thing. So we're going to, we're going to go over the timeline that we now know, and it's still kind of sparse with everything that's been provided so far, but they're still, they still need to look through surveillance video. They haven't done everything that they need to do yet, of course, and it's probably going to be weeks, if not months, until we have like an official exact timeline of everything that went down. But, but there sure is a lot of uh, interesting stuff, so... Garland, Garland, what's up? All right. I love seeing all the regulars on a non-regular night, so that's cool. <laughs> Legal heat, Phil is cool. Self, that's Phil calling himself cool. I need to remember <laughs> the multiple accounts and leave comments. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, we're going to be bouncing around a lot. Um, Leave them in the chat where, wherever you're watching this from. We'll try to get to them. And yeah, anti-gun people are coming out of the woodwork. We're going to see the whole new round of this stuff. Um, yeah. Teachers should be armed with concealed carry. Yeah. We'll What's that? Definitely a topic we'll want to cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, side note, um, right after Sandy Hook was the top reason why I started Concealed Nation. Yep. Because we started the whole debate about should faculty, you know, adults in a school who already have their concealed carry license, you know, for example, should they be allowed to carry and blah, blah, blah. Um, okay. So before we get into this, um, a quick little commercial from one of our awesome sponsors, U.S. Law Shield. Self-defense is an instinct. 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 If you're ever forced to make a life or death decision to protect yourself or your loved ones, you wouldn't hesitate, would you? Would you? Would you? Don't let what could happen after become a courtroom nightmare. Get peace of mind for $10.95 a month. Get the best self-defense and concealed carry protection from U.S. Law Shield today. So 
So we, we all have U.S. Law Shield. We use it. Um, it's self-defense coverage. If, you know, S hits the fan, they're going to have you covered with all, all the huge stuff that's going to happen right after that, you know. Um, it's going to give you a lot less headaches to worry about in an extremely, uh, you know, volatile and stressful scenario. So you guys can go to uslawshield.com slash CCX2. That's going to give you a special two months added to your annual membership. And for the amount of money that it costs, it's like we always say, you get insurance on all your other, you know, stuff. Um, it's a no brainer for us we've had it for years so and the way that things are going you know 11 11 bucks a month and and, you know just as a reminder to people we we always make a big production out of things that are essentially still anomalies we're seeing it happen more often unfortunately but you know killing an active shooter that shooting up a public place is usually pretty clear cut legally. The vast, vast majority of defensive gun uses are nothing like that. Right. Right. So it, it, right. they're usually much more complex affairs. So, uh, you know, uh, walking around w- with a concealed uh, handgun and, and not having coverage this day and age is, is a prescription for disaster. No doubt. Yeah. 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 So again, visit them uh, uslawshield.com slash CCX2. We'll put the links in the chat and they're already in the descriptions for all the locations that you're watching this. Uh, at least at least check them out and then, uh, you know, see what the plan has to offer. So, all right. Um, so, like I said, we learned a lot of new information as far as the timeline. And for anyone who may have been under a rock the last couple of months or a couple of days, this happened a few days ago at an elementary school in um, how, how do we how do you pronounce the. Uh, Rob, this city there. What is it? Oh, the city. I'm not sure. I was. Yeah, it, R- Rob Elementary School. Um, it's a. Uh, it's it's in a small town um, outside of San Antonio. Valde. Yeah. Valde. I I think that's how you say it. Yeah. So basically, the, this kid, 18 years old, goes in, and you know you have 19 dead elementary school students and two adults, two teachers. So today, uh, this morning, we get an update on a little bit, a little bit more of the timeline. And I'll tell you that the day that it happened, I was driving somewhere about an hour away. I get an, I get a, uh, a news notification. I think it was from Google news on my phone. And it said, um, active shooter at Texas elementary school. They had no other information at all. And that went on for about an hour because I kept checking it. You know, I'm driving and I'm checking, I'm checking, I'm checking nothing. And then all of a sudden you you hear the worst. Mm-hmm. So I think now maybe we understand a little more possibly about why there was such a delay in knowing what actually happened. So if you guys are okay with it, um, we'll just, I'll, I'll, Go over this really quickly, the, the stuff that we learned. So <clears throat> you guys can read this on the screen. Um, I'm just going to kind of breeze through it. But so the suspect, he th- this starts with his his grandmother who he shoots in the face. I'm not sure exactly where. I think it's at the residence. And then he takes her truck and he drives it to the school. And he has an accident. He crashes the truck not far from the school like within easy walking distance so he crashes the truck at 11 28 a.m he gets out of the vehicle we don't know when but he gets out of the vehicle makes his way toward the school he sees two people across the street at a funeral home fires two shots at them misses both of them and then he walks to the school climbs over a fence that's about four or five feet tall shooting multiple times at the school and then at 11.40, so 12 minutes after he crashes the truck, that's when he goes into the school in what they believe was a lo- um, unlocked door. They haven't confirmed that yet, but they believe that it was unlocked. He goes down two hallways, and then four minutes later at 11.44, uh, I'm sorry, he goes down two hallways and enters one of the classrooms. And then at 11.44, local police enter the school. They hear gunfire. They take gunfire. And 
uh, I'm, I'm sure they shot back as well. I can't confirm that, but um, so they start moving back and taking cover. They don't make initial entry into the classroom. They call for backup. Um, as they're waiting for backup, they're evacuating students and faculty from the school. They're setting up a perimeter, all that stuff. They try to negotiate with the suspect, which was completely unsuccessful. And then approximately one hour later, uh, that's the big thing that we learned today. One hour later, U.S. Border Patrol tactical teams, that, that's exactly how the guy said it on the conference, press conference, U.S. Border Patrol tactical teams arrived and they made entry, shooting and killing the suspect. The majority of the gunfire was in the beginning of the incident. And then based on many, many, many previous reports, including Concealed Nation, there was no armed resource officer that was involved in an initial in an, in an initial exchange of gunfire with the suspect um he was not confronted by armed resistance until um the police first entered the school at 11:44 so there was no gunfight outside before he got into the school which everyone thought mm -hmm. happened and this makes sense because there was a video circulating of, um, I'm not sure who took the video, but they were in an adjacent building to um, the, the, the main entrance to the school. They're the ones who got the cell phone video of the suspect entering the school. And I'm watching that and I'm thinking, how, why would they be taking a video out there? You know, and it makes sense now because if he were, if he was firing first two shots at people, you know, across the street. People are going to hear that. Oh, what's that? Look out the window. And then he's firing additional shots as he's making his way to the school. Excuse me. Um, you know, that makes sense now. So so that's what we learned. And that's all that we learned so far. But there is a massive gap in time between him entering the school and them going in and taking him down, which is stunning. Yeah, it's hard to hear that time frame. And, uh, you know, I think if we take anything away from it, and I think we learned this with Parkland as well, but having a police unit respond from outside the school when you've already got a threat inside the school is not something that should be relied on to be swift. I mean, it's it's very difficult. They one of the problems when we talk about defending from the outside in or the inside out is if you're coming from the outside in, you don't know, you're not used to seeing the staff and the faculty at the school. You don't know who's a threat and who isn't. The janitor working at the school knows, hey, this that's a teacher, that's a student. The, the police officers responding, especially, I mean, it ended up being a Border Patrol tactical team that came in. I can't yeah. imagine that they were familiar with the layout of the school. I believe they had to get another teacher to unlock the classroom door eventually because they couldn't gain entry into the door of the classroom. And so just that that type of knowledge, when we talk about who is the appropriate class of people to respond to this, for an outside entity like law enforcement to come in, it's a very, very difficult task. And, and I don't know if, if it can be realistically done uh, on a consistent basis. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, one thing that I find interesting about this situation so far is this is a, if anything, an even more glaring example of how the initial narrative is almost never correct. Yeah. So, you right. know, look how all the news broadcasting networks were saying that he was engaged by a resource officer. Turns out it's not the case. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, New York hypocrite, hypocrite poster child for term limits in Congress, Chuck Schumer, uh, made his statement that guns were present and they didn't do anything. No, guns were not present. Right. You know, of course, Chuck Schumer should lead by example and send all of his armed security home if he thinks that there should be no armed security in schools. I would ask Mr. Schumer if his children went to schools with armed security. I, I'm guessing I know what the answer probably is, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this this is the kind of nonsense that comes out. So um, we, we have basically 48 hours have transpired and more now. Okay, almost three days have transpired. And only now we're starting to, to understand, 
you know, what, what may have transpired here. And, and I'm sure in the next three days, there, there'll probably be corrections that come out to, to actually what happened. And we, we went from right. seeing something that I think we had the impression was, um, you know, a determined individual who went in there and just, you know, it happened so fast. There were cops on his heels. That was the impression we were under when we when we first heard of the incident. And now it turns into it's a complete and abject failure all the way around. Failure of law enforcement, failure of the school keeping things secured. They're pretty sure that the door he got in through was was left open. So once again, unlocked, right. Once again, we have a total, total breakdown of, of the whole system. All the pieces that should have been in place were not. Yeah. Well, and maybe we can talk about a couple of these topics individually. So the, the door locks, that's one that's been getting a lot of attention. My kid's school has electronic access locks. But, I mean, how realistic do you all think it is to keep a, a school with all access points secured throughout a school day. There's going to be human failure there. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There's almost always right. going to be human failure. And I, I just finished working on, uh, I can talk about it a little bit, but there's an expert witness case that I was retained to work on. And I'm, I'm an expert witness for the, uh, the plaintiff in this case, it's a civil case, but it has to do with a, um, a liquor store a convenience store that had, it was in a high crime area, had electronic access locks and they knew they were going to get robbed. I mean, this is, this is a liquor store that knew what time of day they needed to turn those locks on. They'd been robbed like four or five times previous. And still you have human error in that. The, the, the attendant just said, ah, it's too much of a pain to buzz people in every time. So I'm just going to leave the locks open. So he just turned it off. So you're, no matter the precautions you take, you are going to have human error. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I, uh, I just want to mention this too, because I was looking at this yesterday or the day before, and it, it really struck me. Um, so these are posts on Facebook, uh, on the official Rob elementary Facebook page. And this is what I, I, I just, couldn't understand it until now. So at 11.43 a.m., so again, back to the timeline, um, 11.40 is when this suspect entered the school. 11.44 is when police first entered the, the first time. So at 11.43 a.m., the school posts that Rob Elementary is under a lockdown status, and then it has a note to the parents and it says, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The students and staff are safe in the building. The building is secure in a lockdown status. OK, so this is three minutes after he gets in there. And then at 1206, so 20, 25 minutes later, they have another update. All campuses are under a lockdown status and. And then it says, uh, you know, again, et cetera, et cetera, um, gunshots in the area. Okay. Yeah. So please know at this time, all campuses under lockdown status due to gunshots in the area, the students and staff are safe in the buildings. Hmm. The buildings are secure in a lockdown status. This was 20 to 25 minutes after they made the initial post saying that they were in lockdown three minutes, that first post three minutes after the suspect had entered. Um, and that, that really surprised me at first, surprises me even more now. And we know, of course, right, things are so fluid, but in a world with social media and whatnot, it's still, you know, it's very strange to me to see something like that. Yeah. So that's interesting. So they, it sounds like they got word that there had been a shooting in the area. Obviously, they tried to go into a lockdown. He was already right. in the building by the time they did the lockdown. Correct. So, I mean, it's a, and I'm not calling them out or whoever, you know, says, hey, post this on the social media page, you know, but it does highlight that there, there was a severe lack of understanding and communication of what was actually happening inside of one of their schools. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And, and I think... You know, a, a lot of people are being, a lot of people on the right right now, I know not to get political on this, are being accused of 
you know, people, the new key word is fatality, but it's just resigning yourself to the fact that these things are going to occur and that there's no way to prevent them all. That's kind of the new, you know, that's the accusation that's going around against the right is just, you don't want to do anything. You've, you know, fatality is what they're calling. It. But mm -hmm. the, the point is, you know, and, and that's, that is an interesting debate because, you know, the, a lot of people don't know that the deadliest attack on a school in U.S. history happened in 1927, and it happened with some sticks of dynamite. And so yeah. it's, a, it's right. a difficult thing. If somebody is intended and, and motivated to cause severe amounts of harm to significant numbers of people, it, mm -hmm. is, you could, it doesn't mean you don't prepare. But it is very hard to harden every school. There's 130,000 public and private K through 12 schools in the United States. It's very hard to harden all those. Yep, yep. we can't. Right. Students, so that that's part of being an adult, accepting that something is going to slip through. But we can do what what can be done to mitigate it, yes. right? And and um, you know when you see politically what is offered, okay, um, the. Uh, the senator from is it Connecticut, Murphy, I forget his last name. He's uh, he's he's in the despicable club with Chuck Schumer, right? He is pushing, mind you, federal red flag laws and background checks. That's mm -hmm. what they want to push. Now, they're not talking about assault weapons because they know they're going to get slaughtered already in the midterms. And that will just add right to their uh Pile of bots because you know we we know how that went in the in the nineties. Bill Clinton said that you know is why uh, is a big reason they lost so many seats in Congress. But anyway, if you think about that, what politicians are offering, and don't worry, I'll get to the bashing of Republicans here in a minute too, because nobody is uh, a saint with this. Um, but coming from mainly the Democrat side, if you look at what they're offering two solutions in search of a problem because tell me and you are a panel of guys who actually do this for a living how many of these previous mass killings would have been stopped by either universal background checks or red flag laws yeah yes that would be correct everybody see what oh. luke is holding up that would be that would be the correct answer so in other words they will dismiss this plan offered by the other side of the aisle talking about, you know, a whole um, complex thing of uh, a, a, a program to go through with schools and looking at the security checklist. And they'll offer this something that has done nothing and will do nothing. Right. So this this is what the political debate is. And if, if you want to look at Republicans, one thing I'm getting tired coming from the Republicans is the harping on mental illness. Because, again, we're now setting up a boogeyman that, OK, we can all say after the fact, yeah, that dude was crazy. I mean, how could you not be crazy if you think if something possesses you to go kill a bunch of kids? Right. Yeah. But again, the problem is, is there a mental health issue in this guy's background? Right. In most of them, there is not. There is not those red flags that have been seen prior to this happening. So we're having solutions being offered in search of a problem. It's not going to fix anything. All of these proposals about red flag laws, um, you know, uh, and, and the focus on mental health, too, is, is going to be equally unproductive. Let me, let me just put this up here real quick. This was just yesterday. A woman yeah. used her handgun that she had at a gradu at a graduation party. Everybody's at a party outside of an apartment complex. They tell some yep. guy to stop speeding. He gets in an argument, drives off, comes back, gets an AR-15 out of his backseat, starts shooting. She draws, shoots. Yeah, him. he's he's no, actively shooting into this crowd of twenty plus people. But him. Yeah, he's the only one that that gets shot, and 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 she killed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she had a because she was carrying a handgun. So you know, I I like this and, story better. I know like that's the story better than the Texas story. What do you uh, got? Handgun. Think? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And 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 this, you know, to even top it, this is this is a handgun versus an AR-15. This is a handgun versus a long gun. You know, so long, long list. Um, long list. Finally, a handgun 
worked against it. Uh, no, no, uh, not finally. Long list of it. Okay, the right, guy right, in Portland, right, Texas, right, he right, killed right. two terrorists stepping out with AK-47s right. with only a handgun. Uh, Johnny Hurley, who tragically was killed by responding police officers, killed a maniac yep. with a rifle with a handgun. Yep. The list goes on. I could name you seven or eight just off the top of my head. So it's been done pl plenty of times. Remember, I would remind everybody that argument. You're not in, you know, a 19th century duel where you stand back to back and then, you know, and you each take 10 paces and one guy's going to turn around with an AR-15 with a red dot on it and you'll turn around with your snub nose revolver. That's not what's happening here. Right. What's happening in these incidents is a monster is looking to rack up a body count. He's got dozens or potentially hundreds of possible victims he's trying to shoot and you've got one person to deal with right the threat and we just see it it happens over and over it, it's a bogus argument everybody understands that it's not ideal going up against that with only a handgun but it's been done over and over and over again if you're good and if you have the stones to do it it can be done mm -hmm. well and you know this brings up a larger topic and i think it's one that everybody needs to acknowledge but there may be six thousand reasons why this shooter did what he did. There may have been six. It's such a multivariate issue that when people propose univariate solutions, it's it we have to reject that wholesale. Oh, if we just did this, it would solve the problem. Now, both sides of the political aisle are doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the left, obviously, you've got people saying we need to ban this particular type of firearm. You know, on the right, you've got people saying, well, here's, like you said, mental health. is mm -hmm. the There are so many different variants that I honestly don't know if we can, if we're capable of calculating it. You know, for example, um, a great, a great source for this type of data is the RAND Corporation, the RAND Institute. And they, what they do is they track every study that's been conducted on the efficacy of firearm laws, firearm regulations, and how they have an effect on crime. And the solution they reached was there is no scientifically provable increase or decrease in crime. There's too many variants to analyze. So the greatest academic minds that we have with all the government-funded resources still say, we don't know. We, we don't know why people do this. Now, I yeah. think there's a lot of things we can talk about. We can talk about commonalities amongst them, right? We can talk about, um, and there's there's a lot of sensitive topics that you're not allowed to talk about, about commonalities amongst who these types of, of individuals are, what backgrounds they come from, what their family life's yeah. like, that type of stuff. But man, it, it is just not the kind of thing that you can propose a single solution for. Right. You know, but we, yeah. we can look at the data. I mean, we can look at... Utah, for example, a lot of people still even today are surprised to know. I'm a professor in Utah. Um, they're surprised to know that since 2004, anybody with a concealed carry permit can carry a loaded firearm on any public school campus, kindergarten through college. And so I ran the numbers and just on college campuses alone, based on the number of concealed permit holders that we have and based on the percentage of permit holders who actually carry based on the, the research that we've done, there's 44,000 people a day on Utah college campuses that are licensed to carry guns. So, I mean, that that's a day per day yeah. just on college campuses in Utah. So the argument that if you had firearms, they would result in accidents or harm. There has never been a single incident of harm that has occurred from a concealed carry, lawfully carried firearm onto a Utah public school. And then on the other end of it, there's never been a mass shooting on a mm -hmm. Utah school. And isn't that amazing? So, are you know, they worried about the forty-four thousand people with guns, maybe? Or yeah, I mean, well, and that's just college. Oh, yeah, might that have something to do with it? Yeah, and that's just college campuses. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, my students know my background, and they will come up and tell me after class, "Hey, I, I carry. I've got your app. I've I've taken your class." Um, it is, it is not uncommon, and it is not beyond reasonable estimates to say there's two or three students in every college classroom, uh, in Utah with a firearm. And again, you could say, well, maybe, maybe that, you know, one of them will have an accident and it could theoretically happen, but we have almost 20 years of empirical data at this point mm -hmm. that we can look at when we're having this debate to say, does it Phil, I'm, I'm, Yeah. I'm glad you raised this. Uh, I did an article 
I want to say it was 2018 following the uh, Parkland shooting mm -hmm. uh, about arming teachers. And um, at the time, at least based on my research, the two safest school districts in the country was the state of Utah and several counties in Texas that have the Guardian program. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, this school that just got shot up does not have the Guardian program. Uh, so this argument that, oh, we don't, uh, the well, the argument's always the same. Oh, well, here's, here's one of the arguments. Oh, well, what if that a teacher who's armed is having a bad day that day? Yeah. And they decide to go crazy and kill everybody in the school. Name me one time that's happened. Every mm -hmm. one of these attacks is a pre-planned thing that goes on for, for weeks or months or years. Okay. Right. This idea that it's going to snap. See what happens is the anti-gun zealots, they're all emotionally unstable people. So they project their own instability onto everybody else. And I'm not kidding about that. Okay. If, if there well, was a way we could empirically determine that it would come out to be true, right? There is this idea that they have where if you, it, it's like, you know, Homer and the, what the Iliad, you know, the sword itself, um, you know, uh, leads to violence or whatever that, that saying is, you know, that that's been completely debunked, you know? So why is it that in the school districts where, it is known that there are armed staff there are the safest school districts. This isn't rocket science. Okay. It's, it's, it's clear. We have years and years. You just mentioned we've got 20 years with Utah. The yeah. guardian program has been around now for a decade plus, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, we have evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And it's certainly, I mean, the fact that the Utah, that it gets ignored wholesale. I mean, that is, that is, Again, in an article I wrote, I said if if cognitive dissonance was a, a a monkey, then ignoring Utah would be King Kong banging his chest on the top of the Empire State Building. Like Utah has had, it, it is the case study on this, and we got twenty mm -hmm. years of it. And so, you know, and again, I'm a professor. I, I I I talk to the other professors in my department. I know what's happening at my college. And I had an incident where I called. I had an individual who I was in a meeting at the college campus. And I watched this individual riding his bicycle. He's probably 45 years old. He was riding his bicycle across the campus. And he was in full camo. And when I say full camo, I'm talking face paint camo. Right. And he's got a rucksack. And he gets off his bicycle and he gets behind a tree where nobody can see him. And he starts reaching into his rucksack, right? So I call the, and we have a state police the department that's on our campus. I called him and I said, hey, uh, there's somebody outside this building acting real suspicious. And, and, you know, I think you need to get an officer over here. It was enough that the other people that were in the room with me started like heading to the exits. It was concerning mm -hmm. them a lot. Wow. And the response I got from dispatch was, you know, it's not illegal to wear camo. I said, I understand it's not illegal to wear camo. I'm telling you this person's presenting themselves in a way that is. And so it took about 15, 20 minutes before an officer came over. By the time the guy, by the time that happened, the guy was gone. So my point is, you know, outside response to these types of incidents is we're, we're not seeing that have the efficacy that we want it to have. And so, yeah, Brandon's got this picture up, which I, I saw you shared. I think that's this in Florida, was, right? Yeah, this was, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's in Florida. Isn't that school? In yeah, Florida? Palmetto, yeah. Florida. Yeah. Um, Lindsay uh, Gunter shared this yesterday and I, I don't know who she is. Um, she's a, a parent of, you know, one of the kids that goes to one of the schools in Palmetto and she shared this and mm -hmm. she says, this is who stands at our one entry to the school all day long, retired combat vet. And, um, you know, like I look at this, we look at this, right? I mean, you're, you're not intimidated by this photo, are you? Um, you don't feel like any of those kids in the background are in danger. Um, it, it's just, but we're going to have the ongoing conversation, you know, the same, same old conversation over and over and over and over again. But I would feel pretty confident if, if this guy right here in that picture was working at that middle school, you know, or el el elementary school, you know, this would not be the story that it is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And and again, you have that mentality though of of fear. What what was it? Jeff Cooper called it hoplophobia. You know, uh, uh, afraid of an in inanimate object that mm -hmm. you know people lose their minds with this. They they would see that and say, oh, you know, I I don't want my kids in there in a, a hostile environment like that seeing that it's just it is insanity to the point where again part of the problem is you know education is exceedingly liberal like i was just reading a survey um like 90 percent plus of education administrators higher end um you know regular public education are you know left of center let's say and you have a reaction where um, I don't know if you guys recall, I want to say it was following Sandy Hook, where there was some town hall that was held. And this woman who was a teacher got hysterical, screaming, you expect me to carry a gun? You expect teachers? I was thinking to myself, nobody expects you to do anything. Right. Okay? Make you. Yeah. The only thing we ask you to do is get out of the way so that the adults can talk about ways that we can mitigate this problem, you know, and, and that is the response. So what we see over and over again, and I'm not talking about just people who most people don't think much about this issue, right? Until there's a mass shooting and the polls show this. And after a mass shooting for about a week, everybody is talking about it. And then the general public goes back to watching, keeping up with the Kardashians or whatever crap that they do. OK, so the invested people, the gun rights people on one far end of the spectrum and then the true antis on one end of the spectrum. OK, it is those people that there's an irrationality that is just hardwired there that I, I don't know if anything can overcome it. You know, this is not somebody who's ignorant who you could explain to them. Well, here's the statistics here, the statistics. And then they say, oh, well, you know, that makes sense. No. People who are truly anti-gun are invested in lifting any expectation of self-reliance off of themselves. And I have been talking about this and writing about it for years, and it is the case. Because if you look at the hysteria that becomes involved with this, that's got to be the underlying cause, right? It's they, they do not want to see, for example, armed school staff because it is not a direct agent of the government who now has that responsibility. Because what they dread is getting to the point where society would maybe one day say, well, why don't you protect yourself, right? That, that's like kryptonite to an anti-gunner, okay? You know, that expectation of self-reliance. So there's an underlying idea there that makes them just completely opposed to anything that would pertain to somebody who is not a sanctioned government entity being armed and able to resist. And, and unfortunately that's, that's what we're up against. Now the politicians, totally different thing. That's yeah. a political agenda of power, but I'm saying actual people, citizens who are so invested in this anti-gun stance, there's no logic to it. Right. Um, Luke, you can bring that back up. Uh, Garland asked, was there, uh, an SRO on duty. No, now it appears there was not. So, well, my understanding is that um, there was, but he was in a vehicle yeah. at the time, and he yeah. he's and he saw the the suspect going in, but he was still in his vehicle. Um, I can't remember if that was part of the news conference today or something after that. It, it was news that came out today um so apparently there was but he wasn't he wasn't in a position to be able to do anything i guess but we're still missing we're missing 12 minutes right mm -hmm. at the very beginning we don't know how long he was in the truck after it crashed and um you know and how long it took him to get from the truck to the school we know 12 minutes between crash and getting into the school but what happened you know all everything that happened during that time we we're not sure yet and that's very important 12 12 minutes is a very long time if somebody's out you know shooting rounds off in front of a like, in front of a elementary minutes? school at the grocery huh? store what was the last one at the grocery store like um, two minutes or something like that or less um even even that i don't think we have an official timeline uh i know that he 
he was planning to do more. He was planning to leave that store and, and proceed with more killings, mm -hmm. but they, they intercepted him. I, I haven't heard how yet, but we know that they, you know, they took him into custody on, on that property in front of the store in, in or in front of the store. So yeah, and Brandon, yeah they, were, they were, they were there quick. I think, uh, I don't know. I think Sal brought up a great issue that maybe we can discuss. And I don't know if you have that infographic, but one of the things that's really difficult in, in this type of a situation is you have a, a very emotionally charged, like everybody, I'm a parent that drops three kids off to school every day, right? Everybody who dropped their kids off to school the next day had the thought of crap. What if this happens? Right. And that's very real. But the thing is, when we talk about this, we still have to be logic driven in how we analyze the data. So the, there have been 13 total mass shootings at a K through 12 school in the history of this country, right? That's, that's what we've calculated. 13 total. That's very rare. I mean, that is very, very rare. You have 50 million students that are enrolled in K through 12 schools. And of those you, you have, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not minimizing the tragedy of it, but you've seen about a hundred of them be killed. And so a, yeah. uh, of that, that is a, and, and so I calculated it and I put it out today. On, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that up here. Yeah. And so that percentage there, that red percentage down a little further. Well, the first thing is the mass shootings trends. So one of the things we have to acknowledge is that the media attention that these get, and I understand why they get the attention, but it makes it seem as if they're on an increase, as if the trajectory of these is they're occurring more often. It is not the case. We have, we are, we're, trending 28% lower this year than we were last year on mass shootings. They they are very rare. There's been 10 of them this year that's occurred. 10 is too many. I'm not saying that I'm okay with there being 10. But the percentage right below that, that 0.0003%, that is the probability that your child will be fatally killed by a firearm on a school campus. If you contrast that with the risk of them dying riding the bus, which is 0.011%. We're talking about a 3,500% greater probability of them dying on the school bus than in the yeah. school. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm not minimizing it, but right. when we have these types of discussions, we have to center it around realism. And, and what I tell people when, when it, because this is, it's difficult to have this conversation. I say, look, You've got a child, your child is in your front yard and running towards your child. There's, there's multiple dogs and these dogs are going to bite your child, right? A bunch of them are little tiny dogs, whatever you'd call them, you know, micro golden doodles, whatever you'd call them. And then you've got a Rottweiler and you've got a pit bull and they're coming, right? Which of those are you going to focus your attention on? Because you can't focus your attention on all of them. And so when we talk right. about response, it's what should we do? And my concern is politically, we'll treat this with the severity that we treat things. Um, I shouldn't say that. I should say the response will be individual rights must be restricted because of this, this risk that's out there. Mm -hmm. And that's what worries me. Absolutely. And that's what it's used for. You know, that that is entirely uh, a politically driven agenda that, you know, they get a lot of mileage out of this. Again, you know, uh, an argument that comes up is we hear so much about a mass shooting like this and it's it's a horrible thing and it gets people emotional. But any given weekend in Chicago, how many people die? How yeah. many children a year die in Chicago, right? We don't hear anything about it. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's used for political manipulation. And the statistics you bring up are, are you know, very interesting. And um, I, I liken it to the idea of how a plane crash gets so much attention, mm -hmm. as it should. Again, it, it, we should learn from what went wrong and make those fixes. But statistically, sitting in a, an aircraft in the sky is statistically literally one of the safest places you can be yeah. on earth right you know statistically right. you're 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 thousands of times more likely to die on your way to the airport in the car 
right? Yeah. You're, you're more far, far more likely to die in your house sitting on your couch than you are in an airplane. And, and that's true, you know, but it's, it's, right. it's such a horrible thing when an airline goes down, right? It's again, it's the headlines, it's all over the place, but we have to stay realistic and, and we put our fears into something that are, it's not 1%. It's literally an infinitesimal amount of 1% yeah. that, that a, a threat like this poses, you know, there, there's a well-known uh, firearms trainer and one of the really clear thinkers in the industry who, who flat out says he does not think that dealing with the active shooter and the active killer should even factor into the plans made by the average concealed carrier because it is such an anomaly that there's no point in gear. If you're gearing towards that, then you're probably missing something in the far, far more likely thing of, you know, being assaulted by, you know, the neighborhood crackhead in the parking lot. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's some merit to what he says. So yeah. we do have no. to keep it in perspective. Yeah. No. And that is hard. And I just, I just want to quickly address this before we move on. I want, I think you're exactly right, Sal, but, to be clear, I when I'm saying 20, we're trending 28% lower. That's based on the time of year right now and the amount of these shootings that had occurred. So proportionately, right, we're 28% lower trending. My point is that's a positive trend. We have less right. of these occurring than we did last year and less than we had during the previous three years. But it's reported in a way that I've got friends wow. in South Africa that are messaging me saying, why do you guys have school shootings every day? Why is this happening all the time? It and depends I'm, on who's doing the reporting. Yeah, I'm responding saying, you know, it, it doesn't. On average, it happens every five and a half years. Like this isn't a, a now that's too much. Again, somebody's going to hear that and say, oh, you're diminishing it. That's too much. But my point is, we're creating a perception in ourselves, in our children. And it's exactly like that. Right. It's why people hyperventilate when they get on an airplane because they're afraid. Right. They're Die. Well, that's right. created by a false sense of the risk, a false perception of the actual risk. Right. Right. Well, and you have and you have some media outlets who, you know, have their own uh, list of mass shootings at schools. And, you know, it depends on what definition they're using. And the majority of theirs, you know, and they'll, they'll list like hundreds, if not thousands of them um, a year. And they include any any discharge of a firearm on school on school property, and the majority of them happen after school hours. A lot of them are gang related, mm -hmm. and you know, or or just kids doing stupid stuff. Um, you know, giving giving people again a false sense of you know the the severity of not not the severity, but the you know the 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 actual true number of yeah. mass shootings in schools yep. um you know if someone came up to me hey hey did you hear about that mass shooting in you know whatever city you know south carolina last night i'll say no i didn't hear about it and then i go find an article and you know oh two you know two gang members were duking it out on school property at like two o'clock in the morning you know yeah. Um, not a mass shooting, even yeah. if there were even if there were 10 of them there and shooting at each other, not a school mass shooting. Right. You know, well, there was not. Yes. And, and this is something, again, that uh, Rand Corporation studied in great detail. And every we're starting to see definitions of terms be politically and and intentionally manipulated to skew the data. So, for sure. example, it's, it's widely reported that there have been 27 mass shootings in schools this year. And there haven't been. I mean, by no, the definition of mass shooting, if you scroll up to the top of that infographic, has mm -hmm. always been, this is the definition the Department of Justice uses, this is the Department the FBI, the FBI uses, has always been four or more fatalities, not including the shooter. So four or more innocent victims in a public, right place indiscriminately indiscriminately yep that's always been the definition and what you're seeing now is it's when there's four or more injuries and some of these some of these organizations are defining injury as hearing loss and so you've got you've literally got an accidental discharge in a spot 
where four people have hearing damage that's being reported as a mass shooting. And so that's where you're getting these numbers of, you know, there've been 200 some odd mass shootings this year. And what it does, it creates this false sense of, of threat assessment within people. And they think this is going to happen. Right. And so you, you can't accurately interact with the world if you've got that false, that false perception. Right. Um, I don't mean to go off track here, but Luke sent an article that I, find is extremely interesting and yeah. and 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 the three of you are um are parents so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious i'm not going to bring the article up it's just you know it's just words but i'll, I'll just briefly go over it um and kind of get your thoughts on this and again we don't have all the information we're not criticizing police you know response to this because we there are so many pieces left to the puzzle that we just simply do not have um but what what we do know is there there was some video that that has come out over the last couple of days from you know parents um at you know behind behind the yellow tape apparently as the suspect was still in the school and they are you know they're all yelling to the police like you know you got to do something you know why are you standing here he's still in there um and then they wanted to go in so people start getting handcuffed and you know that kind of stuff so this article uh the title of it a mother who was handcuffed outside the texas school shooting later ran into the school and pulled her two children to safety so this was a mother who uh let's see she told the wall street journal journal law enforcement was quote doing nothing as the shooter was inside so she was handcuffed uh, before she went into the school. At some point, she was released from those handcuffs. And as soon as she was, she sprinted into the school and apparently found her two kids, grabbed her two kids, and and took off. Um, I'm just reading this now, but so the question for you, you know, parents is, if you you're you're there, would you have wanted to do or would you have done something similar? And secondly, if this story is true, how in the hell did she get into the school? You know, would, would this, apparently. huh? Doors are unlocked, apparently. With this secure perimeter, there's an active shooter that is known to be inside the school and, and someone from, you know, the sidelines runs into the school during this i think we underestimate the chaos of the situation like right. i don't think there was a secured perimeter and i don't think that any of the law enforcement knew how to handle it they couldn't have if they knew how to handle it they would have acted quicker and so they they simply i think it uh-oh uh -oh. i think phil froze <laughs> phil froze a little bit if he, if he doesn't come back i'll i'll send him a text um so well phil, it just phil is phil is full of great insights tonight i hope we can reconnect with him <laughs> yeah no i'm sending sending him a message well you know right brandon now. to answer your question i mean a parent is going to do whatever they need to do and all i can think when i see this response is i'm seeing another situation that reminds me of hurricane katrina when authorities finally show up they do nothing but hurt the situation mm -hmm. Right. Instead of help it. Um, and I, I seem to think that um, and I was hoping Phil would be on because I was going to mention this. But uh, um, is he there, Brandon? Or is oh, he just he's probably uh, rebooting. It looks no, like. he, he's, he's yeah. rebooting. Oh, OK, so but I, I'm I'm starting to think that a society gets the police that it deserves because we've had a decade going on now of of marginalizing police police do the right action many times and and they get you know taken through the the cleaners mm -hmm. for it yeah. okay so now police are not doing what police should be doing you know i i would say um phil can you hear us okay uh we we were just discussing the uh the thing of you know how these police it turns out i mean it's just unspeakable how how they didn't go in there but th tell me your thoughts on this i'm telling the guys that i feel like we're coming to a point now where a society gets the police that it deserves so we're going on a decade of you know marginalizing police 
police over and over again, when they make the right call and do the right thing, are getting demonized. Well, now we have the police, it seems, that we deserve. Because I would say that how long do you think that it would have taken Jimmy Cirillo or Charles Askins or uh, Bill Jordan to have gone into that school? Okay, but the reaction would be, oh, stone cold killers like that don't belong on the peace, police force these days, right? So we we have the police. I guess that we deserve at this point as a society. You know, we it's it's every time they do anything. So it, it makes you wonder: is it that they're paralyzed by fear of that? Are are they indeed at this point now, twenty three years after Columbine? Do they not know the procedure now? Of, of how you make entry immediately? Like, what is the breakdown here? Yeah, I think it's that. I mean, uh, I think that you, I think you don't have sufficient training. It's very hard to train every department and every officer in every department how to handle these types of situations. Very hard. So I think mm -hmm. it's a training yeah. down. Uh, and and again, it's it's one of those situations of, can you prepare for every scenario and, and how I'm not saying we shouldn't, it's not a throwing the flag thing, but the chaos of that situation just presents. It's so difficult. I don't know no, but I yeah. that you don't stay outside for an hour. That is not yeah. the solution for any department. Yeah. And, and again, That's before hard. anybody, before anybody thinks I'm police bashing, I'll mention that it depends on the cop who's there because, uh, Right after the Parkland incident, I believe, which was what, 2018 now, mm -hmm. Parkland High School, um, it yeah. was like within a few weeks, you know how there's always this copycat thing that happens. There was uh, in Maryland um, a guy who came in shooting into a school and a, a cop who was right in the vicinity went in there and blew that guy out of his socks immediately. So again, it's going to depend. You get a real cop like that guy yeah. who shows up and he's going in. Right. So I'm not police bashing. I'm just yeah. saying it's just it, it sure. seems very disappointing that we could have this much police presence somewhere and nobody's making entry into that. There, building. Yeah, they're, they're all different. They're all dynamic. And, you know, is maybe a big part of it is, you know, small town versus, you know, big city type of thing. I don't know. Um uh, last last episode, uh, we had Albany County Sheriff Craig Apple on, who's who's very insightful, and and they in Albany County, you know, he heads up a lot of um, programs to train not only his officers but anybody in the county and beyond that wants active shooter training, businesses, um, you know, citizens, and they you know they put together. Um, these these courses to to help and you know it's great um, but how can you you know like you got to do that across the country you know and you have to train everybody and then people have to they then have the and then people have to then act if they're in that situation and we Greg, all know Greg who's but, been on here was trying to give like stop the bleed uh, classes to some of the schools around here and they didn't even they wouldn't even take it for free. Like just to learn how to stop the bleed and apply tourniquets and stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have an instructor that works for legal heat. That's got some really high end premises security training. Uh, and, and I, I won't say what his job was, but he was over a very large branch of the government security. And, you know, I, I've called, I called my principal where my kids go and I said, Hey, I want to fly him in. I want him to do an audit of the school. I mean, I, I understand. And this wasn't an alarmist. I told him, I said, I understand the statistical probability of this more than anybody you're going to ever talk to. I understand the risks, but still it doesn't hurt. So I'll right. fly him in. I'll have him do it. And the response was, eh, I mean, it was a little, and understandably so. I mean, it's like, you don't want to turn your school into a, into a prison, you know? So he doesn't know what the, the findings are going to be. But I, I got I got a similar response of maybe, you know, right. And people don't you know, they don't want to they don't want to scare kids. You know, they don't want to traumatize kids. And, um, you know, Greg was, talking, or Craig was talking about that a little bit, like not traumatizing kids, but he wants them to know what to expect if something were to happen and like who who they're looking for. Right. Right. And, and you and you and you and you go over that stuff and teach it, you know, with 
younger kids, you know, in, in a different way. Um, so that, you know, so that they can understand, you know, maybe without scaring them or traumatizing them, you know, what, what could happen. And I can almost guarantee you, you know, if you talk to any parent of the, however many kids are at that elementary school that just had this shooting, um, you know, what their opinion might be on, you know, whatever active shooter training or whatnot for their six, seven, eight, nine year olds. Um, yeah. you know, they would probably say, yeah, in every school in the country should yeah. be mandatory. Yeah. I mean, again, it goes back to, I grew up thinking that for sure people were going to try and give me free drugs at some point. And for sure I was going to be lit on fire and I was going to have to know how to handle that situation. So we all <laughs> stop, 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 roll. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I've never been offered free drugs. Um, and so it's one of those things where it's like, you don't want to overemphasize a risk with a child that is so unlikely to occur. So you got to right. find the balance with the, especially with the kids. Hey, if you're a parent like me and you want to bring in these experts to audit the security of the school and I'm going to do it during the summer and I want to make sure it's not happening at my school. Right. Cool. Totally. But I don't want to freak my kids out. I don't want to freak the other kids out with a risk that is so unlikely to occur. It doesn't need to be in their minds. Right. You know, I mean, and it's already on their minds because of the lockdown drills and everything. And I, I think it's a shame instead of people being adults right. about it and the well, kids shouldn't have to worry about it. Right. We, right. We, we have the model. That's what I tell people. It's not like we're, you know, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. You've got the example of Utah. You've got the example of the Guardian program in Texas. OK. And they've had no incidents. Now, a big part I'm convinced of why there's no incidents is because it's the sheer deterrent factor. Mm -hmm. These guys are looking to stack a lot of bodies. They want to break the last record. And the deterrence factor of people in civilian clothing who you don't know who could be armed is a much bigger deterrence factor than even resource officers and whoever is in uh, a uniform. Remember that the Columbine, the original right. two misfits who kicked this horrible syndrome off, right? They shot it out with a resource officer and just avoided them. They went in on the other side of the building, right? So, you know, it's that deterrence. It's that if they want to go on a rampage, they want to stack bodies. They don't want to go in there, maybe get one or two, and then get shot in back of the head by a female teacher who's standing behind them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, you brought up a point, too, that maybe we can talk about. I, I know we're getting to the end of our time, but, you know, another statistic that has been proven, and this is another one that, again, that uh, I keep citing Rand, but Rand has found... And actually, this one comes from the uh, the Violence Project, which is a great another great resource that people should look up. This was a, uh, a funded study by a few PhDs that they they really went through and analyzed the data. But anyways, they found a significant uptick since 2005 in these fame motivation mass shootings, and we cannot just skip over the fact that we've made dozens of movies about the Columbine shooters. They've been in songs. They've got everybody know they're, they're, they're rock stars are we've created mm -hmm. a rock star image about these kids. So if you're an 18 year old that's lost in the world and you're sitting there thinking, you know, I'm going to end it. I can either go out and nobody will ever hear my name or I can live stream this and there'll be Wikipedia pages about me and there'll be the fame aspect of it is, I, I got a friend, I got a message from my South African friend today. And what he said was, why does this only happen in America? Well, first of all, it doesn't only happen in America, but Americans, they love their, their Insta famous status. And so it is a cultural thing where we're trying to find ways to be relevant in this, this fake world of social media. And so we're, we're going to have to figure out how to handle that. And if I, if I were in charge, you do not publish the name of the shooter. You do not publish. I know that's all your policies. Mm -hmm. You do not publish the image. You do not make, you don't publish their manifestos. You don't do that. They are dead. Their, their name is mud. They do not get any publicity. Right. And we could go a step farther. We could uh, then talk all about how uh, looking at their backgrounds, how they were such misfits you know, and such losers 
And, uh, you know, rather than find the fame that they're looking for, maybe really vilify them, you know, but I agree, you know, not using the name at all. And, and, and I think there's a direct correlation with, with social media, which has really made this, uh, right. Thing, right? So if, if the, the way these younger people think, you know, there's, um, the high school beauty queen with her Instagram page. Right. And you know, her 15 minutes of fame and the high school jock. Well, this loser in his basement, you know, who's probably has mental issues of some kind or another, even if they've not been manifest overtly in any way, you know, he wants his 15 minutes of fame too. And, and it's, it's come to this, the, the worship of um, Eric Harris and Derek Klebold is almost universal with all of these young guys who have done this thing of uh, the attacks on the schools, it comes out in all of them, Adam Lanza worship them. And here we are saying the names of all yeah. these guys, but right. But we're, we're talking to an audience that we you know, we, we, we look yeah. at this stuff, right? So it's almost universal, this worship of those two guys, there was mass shootings long before Columbine, but it was that incident that really kicked off this issue with the schools. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Well, um, we're going to have to wrap it up because we are over the one hour mark. This was a great um, discussion, uh, an unfortunate one that we are having. But um, Phil, since you're the guest of honor, any uh, anything else you wanted to add? No, this evening? like everybody else, I've been spending the last couple of days thinking about how you solve the problem. And, and my takeaway is just, it's got to be on an individual level, individual responsibility. I can't control my community. I can't control my country. I have a little bit more control over my community, but I can control my training, my personal preparedness for these types of incidents, how my family treats threats, how we assess danger. And I think that that is the, that is the only way to fix the problem. Top-down approaches, you cannot fix this problem. Yeah. Well said. Green. All right. Well, um, we will be back uh, for the regular time. This is, so this is Tuesday. Um, what's that? Oh, what's on Tuesday agenda? So um, Tuesday, May 31st, a couple days from now, 10 p.m. Eastern, is when we'll be back. Um, what's on the agenda? Um, this is a surprise. No, on a show too? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I don't think we. I don't think we solidified anything. But we'll we'll come up with something good. We'll figure so, it out. All righty. Well, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for being on, Phil. Yeah, Phil, thank you so much. Guys, check check Phil's uh, business out, legalheat.com. Again, you can go on the Google Play app, um, you know, the Apple Store, whatever that one's called. What's the Apple Store called? Apple Store? No, Apple Store, yeah, Apple Store. Oh, so, yeah. Um, search for Legal Heat, download the app. It has, if you carry a gun, if you own a gun, it has so much good information on there. They update it regularly. Um, it's, a, it's a must-have resource for gun owners. So, uh, yeah, Phil, thank you. Um, again, it's always a pleasure to have you, and we will see you guys Tuesday, uh, 31st at 10 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining us. Right. See you then. Tuesday. Let's go right in. <laughs>